From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will provide you with actionable advice about financial planning and analysis today. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FPNA. I am thrilled to welcome today's guest on the show, Nick Brignolo. Nick, welcome to the show. Paul, thank you. Appreciate you inviting me and look forward to the discussion today. Yeah, I'm excited to have the discussion as well. So a little bit about Nick's background. Nick got an undergrad degree in business logistics from Penn State University, an MBA from LSU. He currently resides in the Dallas area. He's worked for a number of different companies, including Keras Life Sciences, Solera, and CloudMed. I actually had the opportunity to work with him for a couple of years at uh, Solera. He's currently the Senior Vice President of Finance and Operations at CloudMed. So maybe, Nick, you could take us a little bit more through your background and how you ended up in FP&A. Yeah, so it was a bit of a circuitous route. Uh, but I was fortunate enough that uh, when I did my MBA at, at, at uh, Louisiana State, I was recruited out of, of LSU. I got an MBA in internal auditing, and I was recruited uh, to a company at the time uh, called Shearing Plow. Shearing Plow was a pharmaceutical manufacturer, a global company, uh, and I spent a couple years in their internal audit department doing operational audits, uh, primarily in the U.S. as well as uh, at a number of their international subsidiaries. And at Shearing Plow, they really had a, um, it really looked at their internal audit group as a training ground for, you know, future finance professionals. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of organizations out there that have like financial leadership development programs like uh, GE has one and a number of the other large Fortune 500 companies also have them. But Cheering didn't have something like that. What they typically had, though, was a was the internal audit group. Mm -hmm. So I spent a couple of years there. And once I, uh, once I was looking to try to get out of internal audit, there were opportunities that were available in finance. And so I ended up uh, in my first finance role as a senior analyst supporting uh, logistics one, uh, as well as uh, supporting quality assurance at um, at shearing, transportation, compliance. So I ended up into finance, uh, going into finance there, and, and ultimately here I am 22, I think 22 years later. I've, I, I've stayed in finance ever since that first FP&A role. So what, what's kept you in finance all that time? What is it that you've liked about finance and FP&A? So honestly, uh, Paul, if I go back like uh, into undergrad, like I didn't even know what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I went into logistics, honestly, because at the time Penn State's program in logistics was ranked number one in the, in the country. And uh, I wasn't really... A phenomenal student in undergrad. I did okay, but nothing to write home about. Uh, and so I honestly didn't really, like, there nothing interested me in terms of work. Um, and, you know, my father had a, like, a small consulting firm, and, and he did some, uh, effectively did auditing work. And I got into auditing at that time with, with his company, and really enjoyed that piece, which was talking to people, learning about their business and trying to ultimately make it better. And from a finance standpoint, from a young age, I really enjoyed numbers and enjoyed math and that type of thing. And, and I was fortunate enough to be able to turn the audit background into a finance career. And look, I really enjoy the analysis piece of finance and I enjoy the, the numbers and I've got a, I don't know if you want to say a, it's a blessing or a curse, but I don't forget a number. <laughs> so when I see a number, I don't forget it. For my team, it's probably a curse. For me, it's a blessing. Um, but um, that's what I really enjoy about, about finance 
perspective, which is literally working with the operations teams on a, a day-to-day basis, really trying to understand their business and challenging them to be better and challenging my team to be better and come, you know, be able to come to them with, with options on this is how I see things. Uh, and these are the options where I think we can, we can become better. Uh, and ultimately, look, it's operations decision, right? But it's our, it's our opportunity and our obligation to provide them op- optionality in their business, but also to you know, help enable them to become better. No, I, th- that makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, mentioning consulting, FP&A is a lot of ways like an internal consultant, right? You're providing yeah. optionality. And I really like how you said, you know, it's your, not only you enjoy it, but it's your opportunity and obligation to push the operations teams and yeah. your teams to be their best, to give them options yeah. and to help them achieve, you know, the strategic objectives and the financial plans of the company. Yeah. So, you know, I know you've worked in a number of different industries. I know earlier in your career, you mentioned the pharmaceutical industry. Maybe can you talk a little bit about like what the key metrics were that you would track in that industry and kind of how FP&A works in the pharmaceutical industry? I know that's a little different yeah. than a lot of other industries. Yeah. So one of the key, um, let's say key metrics, uh, specifically in, in pharma, uh, especially on the commercial side of the business, is really around uh, prescriptions. And that data, you can get that data daily, which is really not that good, uh, the daily data. There's a sample of, I don't remember how many uh, pharmacies or sample data uh, that provide daily data. Weekly data and monthly are the two best pieces of data that you can get. So you buy the data from, used to be a company called IMS Health. They're now called IQVIA, okay? Um, I'm trying to remember the uh, the other company. There's another one that uh, Walters Clore is another one where you can buy data from, and they both have sets of pharmacies that they work with, uh, ultimately to you know to to uh, obtain the data on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And you're using that data really to understand one what you're what you're driving in terms of uh, growth around. Um, you know, your, your RXs, your, your prescriptions. And, and there's two separate types of, of a prescription data. There's new prescriptions and then there's your total prescriptions. Because, look, Paul, if I, if I go to the doctor and I get a prescription, right, and, and I fill it, well, that's a new prescription because it's the first time I've ever done it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, what you, what's the, the, the persistency around that from a, a, a patient perspective? So, you know, how many news turn into to totals uh, over time? It's another metric. Uh, and then ultimately, if you think about, you know, how operations is working in, in your commercial organization, you're looking at things like, um, from a metric standpoint, how many calls a day are your teams, your sales teams making? Um, and how does that translate into to prescriptions and your cost per call? Um, all those measurements on the commercial side of the business that ultimately help drive your your forecasts. And let me say this is that, you know, I was part of a joint venture uh, for almost six years when mm-hmm. I was at Shearing. And the joint venture were for two cholesterol lowering products, lipid lowering products, one that was named Vitorin. The other one was called Zetia. Both products at this point are off, uh, off patent, but they were, the, the joint venture was with Merck. Mm-hmm. Okay? And Merck ultimately ended up buying Shearing in a $50 billion deal. And um, those two products, <clears throat> when I joined the team, the joint venture, there were finance people on the Merck side. There were, you know, I was the, really the first outside of, we had a leader, uh, we had a, a director mm-hmm. or senior director of, of fp I was the first person on the U.S. team uh, as a manager of fp and that, at that point and brought in an analyst and we effectively created our own one-stop shop for our marketing and commercial teams as it related to those two products. And ultimately forecast not just our product, but every product that was part of the category and would provide a, a daily. Because we got to the point where we actually were measuring um, what our wholesalers were doing on a daily basis. Okay, and there's three wholesalers in the U.S. in, in the U.S. marketplace that are effectively responsible for, for 90 plus percent 
of the buys. That's Amerisource Bergen. These are all publicly traded companies, Cardinal Health and um, McKesson. The three mm-hmm. are all in the top. Uh, I mean, McKesson and Cardinal, uh, and I think ABC also. They're all Fortune 15 companies, okay? Yep. A couple of them are Fortune 10. So they're huge companies with very low margins, okay, in terms of how they operate. But we were forecasting what their buys were going to be because we knew when they were going to buy typically on a, a Monday, Wednesday, or maybe a Tuesday, Thursday, trying to forecast our prescriptions and our average number of pills in a prescription because it's not necessarily 30 because people have 90-day supplies. Yep. Um, and being able to understand what our wholesale acquisition cost was, what we were selling out to them, and be able to then provide commentary on a daily basis back to our, our management team. So no one else within the company was doing that. Like they were looking at weekly data, but they weren't necessarily looking at wholesale buys. And when we saw a blip happen in a day, we would then reach out and say, like, what happened to McKesson? Like McKesson was supposed to buy this much. We had an out, a daily forecast on our business. Okay. Um, so those are just some of the metrics. Uh, and we were, from a forecast accuracy standpoint, we were less than 1% from a forecast accuracy standpoint. That probably got me spoiled from a forecast accuracy standpoint. But it's now something that I use as a, you know, an example to my teams today uh, in terms of just from an FP&A standpoint, forecast accuracy and, and really knowing the inputs and the drivers of your model to really understand how you uh, forecast and measure that to always try to become better. Yeah, no, that, that's a great example. And that's amazing, you know, to be so close and a lot of data that you had to put together to be able to do that. And I like how you said really understanding the inputs, right? You have to understand the business and have those driver based models. You're not always going to be within 1%. Every, every business no. is different, right? Obviously yeah. of how accurate you can be, how stable, how hyper growth, what are they going through? But knowing yep. the inputs and knowing the business and the assumptions behind them allows you to manage it regardless of whether you're 1% or 10% off. That's and right. that's really the important thing is being able to manage it. That's right. So, you know, I noticed during your career, and I know when we worked at Solari, you had a little bit of a kind of an operations role. You've done a few different operations in the sales and the revenue side. So maybe can you talk a little bit about the difference between the functions? Because I've seen it so different in each company. I've seen companies where a little bit of F. P&A does some of the sell stuff, does a little bit of revenue. Sometimes they may be doing a little bit of what sits in FP&A. So maybe talk about those lines, how you see them working together and just your thoughts there in general. Yeah. So, yeah, I think every company is different, Paul, in terms of how they, you know, how commercial or sales is is supported. Uh, I've had the opportunity in my career to have sales operations report up through me from an operations standpoint mm-hmm. uh, and analytics, but also, um, you know, at other point in times, like, look, just traditional uh, support of sales. The way that I view uh, support from a standpoint in terms of commercial is, look, we have, there's another, I, I actually maybe am a little bit different in terms of how I view FP&A and, you know, our role within within an organization as it relates to uh, commercial or as it relates even to the operation. But to speak, just talking about sales and, and, and revenue, um, look, I think it's important to really understand, one, just depending on the type of company you're in, what you're, as we talked a little bit earlier about inputs and what the forecast might look like from your, your sales teams. I've been around a lot of sales teams and a lot of times the sales teams will over forecast. Right. They think that they can sell ice to an Eskimo, and that's great. It's our responsibility at FPA to really challenge them, those those assumptions and really come back with, like, we need a view. Okay, it's always important for us to have a view. The operation or the, you know, or the, the operators or the sales teams will always have their own view, but it's important for us to also have a view. Um and I think what's 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 critical as it relates to sales is really pressure test the assumptions that they have versus what our own assumptions would be. Um, and when I see, just depending on the industry that you're talking about, I mean here, you know, on on the on the SaaS side uh, of of uh, the world, you know, 
bookings is a number that, that people look like that, that look at. It's no different than in the the you know the current business that I'm in. We look at bookings too, right? Mm-hmm. But also we need to understand how bookings turn into revenue, right? and and does that you know especially as it relates to a software type company, like how long does it take from a booking to turn into revenue? Right? You need to understand that piece. From an FBA standpoint, also as we talk about revenue, you need to understand what your attrition looks like, right? And and I remember being uh, one time in my career where. Like when I started a new role, I asked for the budget and I literally, you know, I, I didn't get much other than like an Excel workbook, a worksheet, not even a book, a worksheet and said, well, you know, where's the attrition here? One, where's the attrition? Two, where are the, where's the assumptions that sort of built these revenue numbers? And there was, there was nothing, right? Now, when I think about um, planning revenue, and I, and I drill this into my team, but also into our operators is that, look, you guys need to think about a number of things. One, your current base, whatever that is, right? Your current base of customers and how much revenue are you, are you driving through them? And, um, you know, are there any issues around that? Two, you have to think about your attrition rate and your churn. What does that look like over the last 12 months, 24 months for your customers? And you need to figure that in. And also, you need to think about your current customer base and are there some that are already giving you signals that you may lose, okay? Because of one reason or another, maybe a competitive set is out there trying to uh, sell them something or look, you're just not getting the feedback from your customer that you were 12 months ago. Three, mm-hmm. is there an opportunity uh, or, or a risk around um, price? So can you take price? In your current uh, with this current customer, or is there potential for pricing compression with the customer? Because maybe you have multiple uh, so applications that you sell to the customer, as an example, or multiple you know, products, and maybe to get another product in, you need to take price down on one of your current existing products. Are you thinking about that when you're building out your 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 sales plan? And then four. Um, you know, is there, is there a hedge? Is there a, even something else that maybe we're not thinking about that you need to put in? And as, as we build those things out, one, it helps, you know, it helps the, 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 the operations teams really think through all of their assumptions and all the drivers into their business to generate revenue. But it also gives them a feeling that, look, you as an FB&A partner are thinking about those things, right? You're not just trying to hold them to some, some high number, right? We're thinking about these things, and I'm, I'm a big believer in setting a, a plan or a budget or a forecast that is 95% achievable. Can there be some stretch? Sure, okay? But that stretch should not be some, some number that there's no way in heck you're ever going you're ever gonna to get there. So what are all the drivers that are, that are really, you know, and then a bookings number as we started with, right? What's the new bookings? And look, a lot of companies today don't have a pipeline that they can see out 12 or 18 months. They just don't. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, but look, you got salespeople and you know, those people are going to sell something. So you need to make some assumptions around that. And I, that's, you know, as I deal with our uh, operations teams uh, on a daily basis, that's part of the, the discussion point. And look, if you don't believe somebody's going to sell something, great. I'll go to the commercial team and tell them they need to eliminate people. Okay. But they're there with a job every day to try to build their pipeline. And, uh, you know, I think it's important that you're then measuring also on the sales side, Does a, how does a booking really turn into revenue? And look, at the end of the day, some sometimes – Sometimes a sales rep will overestimate what he or she is going to deliver through a booking, right? So you better be measuring that too, okay, in terms of what percentage of the time are they really achieving or what percentage of the total booking are they achieving? Because that's also going to inform you from a forecast standpoint as to the accuracy uh, of the new business. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that forecast from a revenue perspective. Yeah, no, there's a lot of great things. And what I really kind of took away from your answer there is, you know, FP&A, our job is to understand all the inputs that go into a forecast, 
to be able to pressure test it and do challenge and work with the business to help achieve it. That's correct. At the end of the day. And I really, you know, I appreciate yeah. all the different things you went into. And you mentioned especially, you know, sometimes having to discount what sales gives you because they're estimates. Like, oh, we think the business will be 10,000 from this customer a month. And you go back and you do some analysis and, oh, for the last two years, they've averaged 40% of whatever they said, right? right. And you're like, okay, so I know right. I need to discount that. That's right. And so, yeah, definitely. That, that That's a big one. So I appreciate that answer. And I agree with you. You know, sales, revenue, FP&A, there's going to be overlap. There isn't a perfect way to structure it. Every company is going to do it a little different. Yeah, that's correct. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So, you know, I know you're at CloudMed right now and they were recently acquired. And I also, I know you guys also went through a number of acquisitions as you were growing there. So maybe can you talk a little bit about you know involvement from FP&A in that perspective of being uh, being acquired, kind of how you know what role FP&A plays. Yeah, <laughs> a big role. Yeah, I, I can uh, tell I mean, by your, the way your eyes move there. You're like yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, in an acquisition, uh, especially well, any time, and I've been through a number of them in my career now. Um, FP&A provides you know when it comes down to it. There's a lot of information that's provided by FP&A during an acquisition. So mm -hmm. and I'll just give you some examples of, of information, but also of timing, because the timing is also important in terms of how quickly you're able to turn around the information request that you're receiving from you know, a, a potential acquirer. Um, and I think it's important before I even get into uh, you know, acquisition and working through from an FP&A standpoint, it's important that an organization has a lot of reporting that is one accurate and, and has integrity from a data standpoint and a lot of stuff you can just pull right off the shelf. So I, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't remember how many, how many different uh, requests we received during the, during the um, diligence timeframe, but it probably went on for about three months. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there was an initial set of, of uh, information requested. Of course, a lot of the information uh, was blinded, especially around customers, that type of information. But, you know, revenue by customer and, and P&Ls and uh, information around headcount and, and salary information, which also is blinded, right? A lot of that information was for us just off the shelf information. It wasn't off the shelf two years ago when I joined the company, okay? And so we spent a lot of time uh, over probably a 12 to 18 month period building out a lot of really good reporting that had insights into it that helped us drive the business here mm -hmm. and helped us get to that point. But ultimately, you know, during a, an acquisition, you're providing a lot of information. And then when I say information, you're also providing variance explanations and maybe variants at a customer level that you need to explain why did one customer, you know, why did the revenue go up or down year over year for your customer, individualized customers, and you may have hundreds or thousands of customers. Um, and then, you know, when I talk about timing, I, I don't recall there being any time for any information request. And it's not like they're requesting one thing. They may be requesting 
30 or 40 things at one time uh, that we did not take longer than 24 hours to respond and provide back into a data room. So it was critical for us also that we responded very, very quickly to those uh, requests. And then, you know, had, I don't remember how many different meetings uh, to walk, walk the, you know, the third parties through the information, answer questions. I was working Christmas Eve. Okay. We worked some on New Year's Eve through this. So it, it was a long um, three months to say the least. Uh, during that time, uh, there were only a couple of us, myself and one other individual in fp a that knew about the deal. That's mm-hmm. it. Yep. So everything fell upon our shoulders. I, I couldn't mention anything to my team uh, because we, they were under ND, you know, we were under NDA. Yep. Um, so, you know, what we had to keep, you know, was basically do our day jobs and then at night do that job. So the hours were long, but ultimately it got us to, you know, got us to the, the position that we're in today, which is uh, a, a closed transaction and, um, you know, two companies coming together uh, that you know, will enable the companies to grow. Uh, that's it. No, that's great. And it, as I listen to your answer there, I think the thing that stuck out to me is the importance of making sure you understand and you have access to your data that you have clean data, that you're able to present it and be able to explain those variances. Because if you're going through a transaction or acquisition and your data is a total mess, I would imagine it's probably a nightmare. Yeah, and let let me tell you, some of the comments that we received from um, you know, the, the, the third parties were that you know, we, we had very good data and we had, you know, we were very, we were able to turn things around very quickly. And for them, that was very important as they were, you know, there was so much information that they were trying to go through. It's not just financial information, it's legal information, contracts, right? It's all kinds of information mm-hmm. that they were receiving. And from a financial standpoint, for us to be able to provide that information quickly, it enabled them to, you know, to be able to, to start to analyze and, and have their third party analyze the information and come back with questions it just makes it much a much easier and fluid process. No, for sure. I've been on the end with my last company. I helped with building the model for a couple acquisitions and they were very small companies and there were a lot of data challenges. And yeah. Yeah, it was tough sometimes. Everything was still on a cash basis and you're trying to normalize it and figure it all out. Yeah. And yes. It'd be a lot of work when it's not clean data to try to make sense that you're comfortable with what you're being given. That's correct. So, yeah. So I know you've worked both, you know, at a corporate and a business unit perspective, kind of that commercial through your FP&A career. Maybe talk a little bit of what you've seen in the differences in the roles and any advice you'd offer to people in their career if they're trying to decide, you know, should I focus corporate? Should I focus business unit? Should I do both? Maybe just a little around that. Yeah. So I'll start with the corporate piece, which is uh, from an experience standpoint, probably less than on the operations side uh, from an FP&A standpoint. But from a, a corporate perspective, I mean, those roles are really for individuals that um, you know, really like more of the consolidation, uh, the you know running processes around budgeting and forecasting, seeing the overall organization and, and what the numbers look like and, and helping to you know, work with the finance, you know, your, your partners really there are the other finance uh, or FP&A teams mm-hmm. that uh, you are effectively supporting, right? They're, they're your, your business partners in essence. So you're working with other finance teams and saying, look, you know, we may be behind or ahead or what have you, you know, can you guys drive more or what are the risks and opportunities around that? And, and running the, you know, a monthly process around results and consolidations um, and putting together processes that, that help make those things more efficient uh, for the organization. It's more of a, a topside view of, um, you know, the business as a whole. On the operational FP&A, or it depends on where you're sitting, right? I've, <coughs> excuse me, I've supported commercial I've supported manufacturing in my career. I've supported research and development in my career. Almost anything you know, from a a, um, a business operation standpoint, I've supported in my career from an FP&A perspective. And honestly, that's the piece that I love 
more, which is really getting into the operation and working with the operation to help them achieve their goals and objectives and you know, helping them see around the corners uh, in terms of blind spots that they may not you know, see and helping provide them, uh, you know, drive, uh, helping to drive the business. To me, that's, I mean, if, if you really enjoy operations or working with operations, because look, at the end of the day, FP&A's value doesn't come from you know, putting together variances. FP&A's uh, you know, value comes from really understanding the business and partnering with the business. And to me, that's where I really look to, to try to excel on a day-to-day basis with our business. And look, right now I'm I'm I am uh, you know I'm in a new role. I'm still feeling, I'm still not not knowing everything. Uh, I'm only three weeks into a new role here. Uh, but what I will say is that look, I I'm going to be working with operations on for for our legacy company and as well as a new company. And it's important to really understand your business. And when I say understand, I mean you should know that business. And you're not going to know everything. You should know 80% of what that business does, really. Right? You're not going to know that you know that you got to push this key or do that thing, right? I mean, those are tactical type things. Yeah. But really, the strategy and what they're trying mm-hmm. to accomplish on a daily basis. And if that type of those types of things interest you, then look, the operational side of FP&A really, you know, really is an area that uh, you should you should think about going into. And when I say the operations, I mean, look, I think that my experience in manufacturing, uh, manufacturing finance really helps me to this day. And when I say that, I, it's because manufacturing is a little different than any other area. You start talking about manufacturing, I'm talking about yields, okay? Yields for machines. What's the yield? How many, you know, you put 100 pieces in and how many do you get out? You get out 99 or you get out 90? Now, you don't want to get out 90, for sure, because then there's a lot of, of loss uh, product from that standpoint and loss of yield. And I talk about that stuff today with people in terms of what are, what's our capacity, right? What's a person's capacity? Can, you know, I don't think about eight hours in a day. I think about 80%, you know, productivity out of an individual. So, you know, when I first got here uh, to Cloudman, one of the first questions I asked was, um, you guys have a standard around, you know, when you want to add a head, what that really means, nobody can answer the question. And I said, well, look, then we're going to establish a standard. And that standard for me is 1,600 hours, right? Effectively, it's almost 80% of somebody's time in a full year. But people have meetings, people take PTO, people take lunch, people do whatever, right? So you've got 1,600 hours a year. So when you come to me, I'm always going to ask you the question, what is that person going to do for 1,600 hours a year? I hope you have an answer. Well, at this point, our operators already understand in, 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 in any organization I've worked in that that's the first question they get. And it better be, you know, these are all the things, this is why, right? It's not just, you know, because people will always come with a number. I need 12 heads. I need five heads. I need whatever. And the question I always ask is, well, how do you know it's five? Okay, because that's 8,000 hours. So how are you getting there? Okay, and I'm more than mm-hmm. more than willing to approve if I can see how we're going to get there. Yep. Okay, because FBA, in my opinion, Paul, is not just a uh, you know a controlling type org. Okay, yep. yes, we have that responsibility, but we should also be an advocate for mm-hmm. our businesses. Okay, when maybe they can't get there themselves. Okay, we need to make sure that they understand how they can ultimately build a business case to get us there too. Okay, because. Our job is, in, especially supporting operations, is to ensure that the operations are, are properly resourced, okay, to enable them to get to the number that they need to get to and advocate sometimes for them also, rather than just being the, you know, the gatekeeper. Um, and I think that that's where successful FP&A relationships live, is you have to be able to, to walk the balance, to walk the tightrope and have that balance. And that makes you, that will make you more successful because honestly, in my career, I have had the opportunity and been fortunate enough that my operations folks went to bat for, for me 
more than actually the FP&A uh, individuals mm-hmm. that I reported up through. And so when there were layoffs and, and, and rifts, those types of things, more than once in my career, my operators went to bat and said, look, we cannot afford to lose this guy, right? Like youth may think so, right? But this guy knows my business better than guys that work in the business. And there's a value because he also understands all the numbers and the decisions that we make and how that, you know, how that impacts us. And I think that, you know, that's important. You know, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. I really appreciate the answer and going through the first part, you know, I think you summed it up well, corporate consolidation processes, working with the rest of finance reporting, you know, when you get into the business unit, it's really about understanding operations, understanding commercial, you know, you're getting into strategy and really business relationships with the, you know, the people in the business. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's a good way for people to look at it. You know, what do you enjoy doing? Where do you want to do? And also some of it depends on where you want to be. Ultimately, sometimes a corporate role can help with that yeah. progression, but I think there's a lot there. And I like the second part of, you know, really being a good partner with the business, knowing the business, understanding it. I remember you talking about capacity and it reminded me of actually a meeting with you where we were looking at sales capacity. You know, well, what's your number? What's your seasonality? What's this? I remember mm-hmm. I could picture you asking me all those questions as you were talking through it because I remember that uh, discussion on one of our uh, businesses. Yeah. So I, I definitely know that's something that you you know push on. And I think it's really important. The one other thing I want to highlight from what you said there is being an advocate. Can't stress that enough. Sometimes finance has the reputation of just the no guy. Yeah, And that's if that's right. all we're going to be, nobody's going to want to work with you. That's right. You have to be willing, like if they need, if they need 8,000 and they can support it, you need to go to bat for them. And I know I've, I've had to do that more than once, but I've had a, you know, there's also at times I've had to tell the business, look, I can't support this. You right. don't have the documentation to support it. These hires here, I can support these three. I can't come back that's to right. me when you, you know, you have the, the capacity numbers that can support it. And I'll be happy to raise it forward as a, you know, potential hire. That's right. So I agree a hundred percent on that. Yeah. So, you know, we're coming up here kind of toward the end of our time, but just a couple more questions for you. One, maybe can you talk a little bit about how your finance team is structured fp a you know, do you have analytics under you? Do you do sales commissions? Just talking a little bit about kind of, you know, the scope. I mean, obviously I know budgeting and forecasting is there, but yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, in, in the, in the, you know, the cloud med organization, we were really, we had all, okay. I had corporate as well as we just weren't big enough to separate the two. Sure. Yep. Uh, so we had corporate as well as, um, you know, operational finance support and, and, uh, <clears throat> but we also developed a lot of analytics within my team, which, which ultimately has then, there's been a, uh, sort of a, a a spin out of an analytics team that was developed internally as well. That team doesn't report in through me, but mm-hmm. we were really the first ones to help start driving uh, analytics for the company as it related to operational type stuff, which yep. is effectively um, how we're building out our, our revenue models. So we didn't have any revenue models when I joined. We had, uh, I think, one. <laughs> um, and we then I then harkened back to uh, an, another company that I worked with at Karis when I actually had the opportunity for about two and a half years to run RevCycle. Okay, and effectively that's what CloudNet is is a, a revenue cycle leakage company. And um, I thought about how or how are we going to get our hands around revenue here? And uh, worked with one of one of the guys on my team, and now everybody knows how to do it about building out a a model. Mm-hmm. And and that model has you know, we're we're within you know, again plus or minus two and a half percent of our numbers from a revenue perspective. But bringing that to the operators and and um, so our team is really I don't have anything of a team uh, in, in the legacy cloud med business. There's only five or six people. They support the operations, uh, but they also do you know they they do a lot of analytics work as well uh, around uh, the business and 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 meet with their business partners on a weekly basis to go through that data and and really help them, you know, manage their business. Mm-hmm. Uh, because a lot of the companies that were that were part of this organization or that were acquired were smaller. I'm talking about 10, 15, 20 million dollar companies, which didn't really have FP&A and didn't have modeling and um, 
we've had to bring them into our processes and, and, and they've been very appreciative of, of that, but it's, it's really more around, you know, the, the teams are, you know, day to day working with their business partners, but mm -hmm. separated by, by business effectively, sure. or maybe they support multiple businesses just depending. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, a piece that is doing consolidations and reporting for the entire, you know, world. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. And one thing there that I think has been a broad discussion lately is analytics, right? You had yep. that in FP&A, you broke it out. There's a lot of questions. Should that belong in finance? Should it be its, long, its own organization? Because finance has to have access to so much of the data. So I appreciate yeah. you kind of talking about that and how you've worked closely with it, because I think that's a critical thing nowadays, the analytics and the data. Yeah. And look, I... I Look, I mean, we we are joined at the hip. So, by the way, the, in, in our company, the the, the guy who uh, is running the analytics team at this point is uh, used to report into me. Yep. Okay, and, uh, and now he's his own separate. He's really operational analytics. But sure, look, we are we we have a, a. It's important for finance to understand what is going on there, and and we're brought into all the conversations. Mm -hmm. We're in the meetings, so we know what's going on, and we're sharing data too. Right. I mean, our original uh, models, like they've taken those models and they're building out their own, which is great. Operations yep. need their, needs their own, but also you know, digging into other uh, analytics and, and using AI and those types of things to help drive, you know, better, you know, better forecasting, and which is great for everybody. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, analytics and data are really key ingredients of FP&A today, not to say that they weren't before, but really being able to, 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 to deal with a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Okay. And being able to manage through that is important skill set today. No, I, I completely agree with you. It really is important. So now we're going to go a little bit kind of a personal here a question we like to ask everybody. So this is one we do on all our shows. What is something not many people know about you? Something they wouldn't find online? That's a good question. I don't know. I lived overseas for a couple of years. Um, you probably can't find that online and really enjoyed that. My, my oldest was born overseas. Um, and, um, you know, just an area that, uh, I was fortunate enough to live in Italy for about two and a half years okay. and, and, uh, really enjoyed my time there. And, and ultimately, um, you know, can't talk, uh, about the country enough and the experiences that I had there that helped you know, mold me into who I am today. Great. No, that sounds like that was a wonderful experience. And actually, I don't think I remember hearing that, that you'd lived overseas. You might've mentioned it before, but I think I didn't know that either. So that's great. Next one that we like to ask everybody, what is your favorite Excel function? So look, Paul, I'm old <laughs> enough to remember Lotus 1, 2, 3. Okay. Uh, but uh, in Excel, and, and and I do some work in Excel nowadays, at, at, but Probably for me, I and I haven't graduated yet to uh, like XLOOKUP, but I use VLOOKUP a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and you know just some basic ones like some ifs, um, but probably VLOOKUP to me is very powerful. Uh, my guys on my team have tried to teach me XLOOKUP, but I haven't gotten <laughs> there yet. Uh, but uh, I can at least do the V and H lookup stuff. Well, I offer uh, an Excel training course that has X lookup. So if you're interested, <laughs> Nick, take, you know, yeah, we can, we can I, talk offline. <laughs> yeah, I may need to, I may need to take that. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the guys today that are in their 20s and 30s are, I mean, amazing. Uh, with sure. With Excel skills. And even in their 40s. I mean, I just, I didn't have email in college. in undergrad, <laughs> So it, it just tells you how old I am. I, in high school, I used, I think it was Lotus one, two, three, a little bit of Quattro pro. So I can relate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm getting up there myself. So I, under, <laughs> I understand what you're talking about. All right. So last question here, and then we'll let you go. If you could offer one piece of advice to someone starting out in fp &A today, they wanted to be an fp &A professional. They're just starting their career. What advice would you offer them? Uh, hmm. So this is what I would say. Listen a lot. Okay. Listening enables you to really learn. And I think that, you know, honestly, in, I was fortunate enough to be an auditor, which required me to listen a lot to really understand process and, and really help, help me learn the business. I would say, if you want to, if you want to be an FBNA, 
One, you know, in a lot of organizations, still systems are poor. Okay. Processes are not great in a lot of organizations still to this day. And if you want to be in a, a role that adds value to the company and you can really see an impact being made, FPA is a great place to be if you're not afraid of numbers. Right? You have to be very comfortable with numbers, um, but you can build a phenomenal career uh, in FPA. and a and, and if you're fortunate enough, depending on what track you want to take uh, in your career, if you want to go down the, you know, if you want to be in finance and, and be in FPA, FPA really is, as Paul, you said earlier, it's almost like an internal consultant. Uh, and I think that for those that really enjoy that type of work, this is a great place to be. Uh, and honestly, I don't really feel like I work. I mean, I, I work hard, but every day, I don't, I don't really feel at this point in my career that I work anymore because like I've been through enough. Uh, I've been here long, been around long enough that what I do, I enjoy every day. And if you are fortunate enough to listen a lot and learn a lot in your role, you can be very valuable to an organization very quickly. Uh, and the, the skill sets that FP&A bring, which are really around analysis and partnership, honestly will, you know, They'll help you in other areas in your life too, uh, especially in the partnership piece. A lot of a great advice there. And I love, you know, the first piece there, just listen. Yep. So critical to, in, in the world today, not just in the profession, but just in general, listen to people, hear their side, hear yep. what they're trying to explain and just stop. Don't think about what you're going to respond with. Don't think about, well, here's my position. Yeah. Just give them a, that opportunity to share what you need to know. Exactly. That's really, really valuable advice, and it will definitely help you move up. So I've really enjoyed our conversation today, Nick, and having you on the show. Thanks so much for being with us, and you will look forward to chatting with you again, and I'm excited for our audience to get the opportunity to listen to you. I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you very much. You have a great day. You too. 